Hey, welcome to Eastside Online. Uh, we've been doing this and learning a lot about how to do this. And man, we're so happy uh, that so many of you have jumped in and been a part of our services online. And so it's been a great experience for us. Uh, we'd rather be together. We all know that. Uh, but this is the next best thing. And we're so happy uh, that you're here with us today. We're starting a new series uh, today. It's going to lead us up to Easter Sunday. It's called A Weekend to Remember. And we're going to dive down into the last weekend for Jesus. What happened to him on Thursday and Friday and Sunday? And we're going to dive into that. You're going to find some really good stuff that maybe you didn't know before that's going to help you in your walk uh, with Jesus. And so Winston today is going to start with Thursday and kind of detail for us what happened to Jesus on that day. And it's going to be some really good stuff. So I'm glad that you're here. Uh, we've got some great songs, some of our favorite music here at Eastside. And I just encourage you to jump in and worship with that as it comes along. There's going to be a time for communion. So my suggestion would be go ahead and get your communion ready. So when that time comes in the service, you can go ahead and, and participate in communion and then uh, get ready for Winston's message. He always does a great job and I'm excited about what he's going to share with us today. So thanks for being here and uh, let's have a great service today. Enjoy this. Good morning, Eastside. We are so glad that you have chosen to get online and worship with us today. We're just going to sing these songs of praise. Let's do it. Praise the hallelujah. In the presence of
promises in his word to rescue us time after time after time. We gotta believe right now that he's gonna do it again. Let's just sing these words out together today.
So we just sang about God doing his work again and again and again. And you know, there's some things he wants us to do again and again and again. And one of those is communion. We know from the early church, from Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says, and we came together on the first day of the week to break bread. And what we get from that is that this was an important thing for them to come together on a regular basis and share communion. And as you know, we do that at Eastside every weekend when we get together because this is the core, this is the heart of what this is all about, that Jesus died for us on a cross. And so I'm gonna pray about that and right where you're at, why don't you share communion? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that your grace led your son Jesus to come to this earth and through his willingness, his compassion and love for us, that he died on a cross so that the penalty of our sins would be paid for. Lord, that is the heart and soul of everything we do in our relationship with you. And right now we remember it so that we will never, ever forget the price that you paid. We love you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Thank you. 
I want to thank you for your faithful, generous giving during this period of time. I know it's it's hard for a lot of people right now. I really do. Uh, we're all kind of in this together, but you have continued your generosity, and I want to take a minute to say thank you for that. We are continuing all of our ministries at Eastside. We're being smart about it. We're really giving thought to all those things, but those things continue on, and they don't happen unless you're faithful and unless you're generous, and you have been, and I want to say thank you for that. I want to encourage all of us to continue that. So when this service is over with, I would encourage you to stop right then and do your giving at that time. If you're not registered online, that's a great time to do it. Get on our app, get on our website. You'll be able to figure that out, register an account, and be faithful to that because the work of God is continuing uh, through your faithfulness. And I, I just want to say thank you for that. Recently, one of the areas that we support is a work down in Arizona Reservation Ministry. They're doing an incredible job down there, and we sent a team of our people down to work with them for a week, and fortunately, we were able to capture some amazing video from that, and so we want you to enjoy that and see the great work that is going on, just one one great work of many that is happening because of your giving. So thank you for that, and enjoy the work of God that is going on. Watch this, if you will. At the urging of our mission trip leader, Donnie Rourke, we wrote down our thoughts the last day we were at the uh, Arizona Reservation Ministries in Globe, Arizona. And what I found has changed my life completely. Though the plight of this native culture exists everywhere I look, I see through the despair more clearly than ever before. I've been here for just a few days. The unemployment rate hasn't changed. The suicide rate hasn't dropped. The trash is still visible, as are the signs of extreme poverty. So what's changed? What is better today than when we arrived Sunday afternoon? I have. I'm different. By my very nature and my professional training, I look for the negative. I look for what is wrong and try to make it right. Let me tell you, that's often a burden for me and for those around me. So what's different? What's changed in me? For one, my level of expectation is different. We aren't going to see some seismic change in our lives or the lives of the Apache brothers and sisters we've met because we came here. And today, I'm okay with that. Because we came to this land, at this time, I'm better. I'm more complete because of Roxy's beautiful smile. I'm blessed because of Prospero's story of salvation. And I'm grateful because I got to work alongside a true gentleman like Mike. I'm honored that I got to pray for and with pastors, Vincent and Jonathan. I've been shown that children are children and they're joyful even when they are dirty and scarred. I got to see privileged white people sob openly because their hearts were broken while they sang Jesus Loves Me with Native American children who we think have little to sing about. I'm changed because even in their despair, the residents of San Carlos find joy in the same things the residents of my small town find joy. Playing catch with a softball celebrating a birthday with family, happy birthday signs and all. I'm changed because I got to play tic-tac-toe on a concrete pad with boys from this troubled land, and we laughed. I'm changed because light came shining through where before I saw only darkness. I'm different because now I see that one by one, one heart at a time, he is changing this place, and he's changing me. And that's a beautiful thing.
Hey guys, we're about to start a new series this week as we go into the Easter season, and it's going to be called uh, The Weekend to Remember. And I think about the events that we, we read in the Word, and it all starts on that Thursday when they have what I believe is the most famous meal the world has ever seen. Literally millions of Christians reenact this meal every single Sunday. And, and when I put myself in, in Jesus's situation and he has all these things that he can share with his disciples, his last moments with them, and he didn't send them on a mission. He didn't give them a bunch of theories. What he chose to do was give them a meal. And so I'm gonna shoot straight with you. I hope by the end of this message that you have a deeper understanding and love and appreciation and knowledge for communion. Something that is very important here at Eastside, something that we take each week. And so before we go into further parts of this message, I wanna have a confession for you guys. Um, I actually grew up in a small church up in Michigan, Chelsea, Michigan, and it was in an area where there were a lot of retired uh, four GM Chrysler workers. And, and these men and women, they would, they would do so much to invest in the church and, and keep it going. And they would shovel the snow and they would, they would get all the slides ready and they would play the organ or the piano. Uh, but one of the guys, what he would do each week is he would prepare communion. He would go back and get uh, a bottle of Welch's grape juice and fill up those little cups. And then he would get Wonder Bread and he would actually cut the bread into little pieces. And, and after communion was over, uh, he would set out the leftovers in the back. But I remember in my mind when I was taking communion, uh, I would do the whole thing. It felt very ritualistic. I would, I would say the prayers and, and I would remember what he would do. And I would take the, the juice that represented his blood and, and I would take that little wonder bread that would represent his body. And, and you'd think I'd be thankful for what Jesus had done. Uh, but my confession is I was most thankful for the leftovers that were waiting for me in the back. You see, he would set them all out and I would, I would run to the back after service. He would have them waiting there in the kitchen and I would, I would shot glass those little grape juices and, and I would take down that bread. And, and that was the extent of what communion was to me until I got to Bible college. And so I was 19 years old and I went down to this, this, this small college in middle of Missouri called Central Christian College of the Bible. And I'm sitting there in my theology class and Dr. Axton is sitting across from me and a, a group of 20 other students. And, and he tells all of us that we are going to write a 20 page paper on a topic that he gives us and it's due at the end of the semester. And so he went around and he told everyone the topic that they would be writing on. And, and me just trying to figure out how to even write a five page paper. I was like, what in the world could I write about for 20 pages? So he got to me and he said, hey, Winston, you're gonna write a 20 page paper on the Lord's Supper. My jaw literally dropped. I thought, how in the world am I gonna write a 20 page paper on the bread and the juice that symbolically represent what Jesus did for me? I mean, what kind of meaning does this have? Like other than that one uh, symbolic understanding that we have, I could be no more wrong. To this day, that probably is the most wrong I've ever been about anything in the word of God. The depth, the understanding of, of what communion is, I, I was so off. I mean, with the observance of this, it, it, it's simple enough that a child can understand, but the spiritual ramifications few understand, even those who are mature in their faith. So today we're gonna learn what the Lord's Supper is all about. 
So we're gonna dig in the word and we're gonna talk first about the pre-meal, what was leading up to the Lord's Supper. And, and essentially we read in, in Mark 14 that there's, there's this great scenario where Jesus is with his disciples and, and you know that it, it's heavy on his heart. He, he knows what's about to happen uh, tomorrow at that time, Thursday, you know, waiting to Friday. And, and he goes and he tells his disciples to go to this village and, and everything they need will be there waiting for him. And, and we're gonna read here in Mark 14 starting in verse 13. This is what it says. So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. And so we read this and it's crazy to me because this is one of the last miracles of Jesus. And this miracle doesn't have the the umph of feeding 5,000. It doesn't have the power of Jesus calming a storm, rebuking it, be still or even uh, the, the, the kind of fright that happened with the disciples when, when Jesus was walking on the water. But nonetheless, in this moment, there's another sign of the power of our Lord. I mean, we read in here, he sent his disciples and, and God set in motion that there would be a person carrying a jar of water. Jesus made sure that that person was doing that. And Jesus set in motion that a man would prepare this room for Passover, knowing that someone was going to use it, not knowing that it would be the disciples and our Lord. Jesus set all this up. And that's something that we can celebrate even before the meal started. He had already put his touch on this moment. So then we get into the meal and the meal is something we could focus on 10 things. I mean, when we get there, he is in that moment and he starts washing the disciples' feet. One of the most humbling stories we have in the Bible. He's, he's washing their nasty, stinky feet. They only have sandals and, and hygiene is not the highest priority in, in ancient Israel. And, and so he's washing their feet and there's the famous story of him washing Peter's feet. And he's like, you're not washing my feet. And he says, yes, I am gonna wash your feet. He said, okay, then wash my whole body as well. So we have that moment. Then we have the moment when he says that the person that is going to betray him is in their midst. He's actually breaking bread with them and and all the disciples are confused. It's not me, what do you mean? And Judas, he is actually released to do that duty. But the disciples didn't think anything of it because he was the treasure. Maybe he was going to to go pay the bill. And, And we could focus on any of those things, but I wanna focus on the actual meal and what was happening within that meal. So we see in there that, that in the meal, the, the best way that I read it in scripture is we see it in some of, the, some of the gospels, but Paul says it best. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, he said, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he went on in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. I love this last part. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and they drink of the cup. So we have this big piece of scripture about the Lord's supper. What does it mean? That's the question. What does it mean? Because again, we take it here every single week and and we've heard different explanations. There's been communion meditations and and people sharing in depth. But, But when I read all this, 
what does it mean when it pertains to us? We see actually some truth, three things that Jesus directs us to do directly pertaining to the Lord's Supper. There's three things. And one of the things he directs us to do is, is he directs us to look back, to give our attention back. And, and what I mean here is most of us, when we look back, we look back at the cross and we say, I'm, I'm gonna remember what Jesus did for me on that cross. I'm gonna remember that he died. He shed his blood. He had to pay the price for me. But that's not all that it's saying. Actually, to understand and to look back and to, and to really believe and understand the depth of what Jesus did on the cross, we actually have to go further back. So we go 2,000 years back to the cross. From that point, we have to go over 1,400 years back to the time of Moses. And some of you have heard the story, so forgive me if it's redundant, but the story goes like this. In, in Exodus chapter 12, we're reading about Moses and Aaron, and they're having this toe-to-toe -to -toe battle with the Pharaoh. Essentially, the Pharaoh, he doesn't want to let them go. He is bothered by them. God has sent Moses to bring the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and, and bring them to the promised land. So the Pharaoh... He's like, no way, I'm not taking this, this nation of people that are building my pyramids and my cities and they're my slaves. I'm not gonna let them go. And, and Moses says, okay, here's a plague. You know, here's uh, frogs over the nation and, and locusts and the river turning to blood and, and turning his staff into a snake. And at, at some points the Pharaoh's like, okay, that's, that's impressive. But we read in scripture that his, his heart is hardened and he doesn't turn from his ways. So God says, okay, I, I gotta do this now. What I want for you to do is I want the people of Israel to slaughter a lamb. And this lamb has to be one year old. It has to be without blemish. It has to be perfect. And I want you to have this meal to represent uh, what was shed for you guys, this, this sacrificial lamb. And I want you to take some of that blood and I want you to put it on, on the two door frames and I want you to put it on top on the, on the door post. And so we see in this moment that in Exodus chapter 12, when they're looking back, that God ends up sending the angel of death and he passes over the Israelites. He passes over them because the sacrificial blood that is wiped on their doors. But what happens in return is now he strikes down the firstborn children of all of Egypt, every single firstborn. He even strikes down the firstborn cattle. And he sends this message to the Egyptians and, and it's crystal clear, let God's people go. And so at that point, God said, we are going to celebrate this feast every single year. And it's gonna be the Passover feast. And we, we read in his word that, that he wants his people to celebrate this because God chose to literally pass over them in their sins and not strike them down. And so now with Jesus, we see that, that he is our Passover lamb. It says here that, that he has chosen to go to the cross and be that new covenant for us, that new person that should be us. We should have been in that place we should have been the person that died, but he chose that, that we would be that, that person. And so I think about that, looking back, we have to look back and remember Passover that leads into the cross. And, and then the question is, okay, that's one thing that we're directed to do, look back, but why do we have to do this every week? I mean, are, are we not intelligent enough to remember every month or every two months or you know, quarterly, why do we have to do this every single week? Well, I think about with my wife and 
she uh, she gets annoyed with me, bothered, irritated, whatever you say. She gets bothered with my memory. And, and I tend to forget things at times. And, and I know in my home that, that there are moments that I, that I could be better. Um, you know, I remember a lot of things though. I remember the car seat. I remember, you know, the stroller, the diaper bag, but she's so upset because I forgot the baby. You know, what's the big deal about me forgetting that, that creature? But nonetheless, she gets frustrated with me because of my forgetfulness. Well, I was really intrigued with this part because scripture says that we are to take this every week, every time we come together, do this in remembrance of him. And so I thought, okay, God, you always have a reason for why you do things. Why would you have us do this each week, every time we we come together to celebrate? So I started doing some research and I was looking up on Harvard School of Medicine, uh, some of their studies on the human brain and our memory. And they had different types of memory loss that we have, but the one that every single person on this planet has is called transient memory. We have transient memory. And with transient memory, it's essentially the tendency to forget things pretty quickly after we hear it. And, and our mind works as a filter and it'll throw out certain thoughts that we know we won't use. And it does that to create an efficiency in our mind. So when, when reading that, it's saying if we don't use it, then it's probably gonna be thrown out. And so over time, as we don't hear those concepts or those stories, we, we tend to let them fall into the sunset and just by chance, maybe we think about them again. So with this, if this is the case and we have transient thought, I believe God has set it up that we remember Christ every week because we don't wanna put it in the back. We don't want it to be lost. I mean, communion should be at the forefront of what we do each week, remembering, remembering what he did for us. And so I wanna know it, I wanna hear it, I want to remember that covenant that Jesus set in our place, that Jesus Christ died. And now there is a bridge between us and God. And now our relationship can be renewed daily and we can relive the idea of Christ's death and resurrection. So that's why God directs us to look back in communion. Another thing we read in the Lord's Supper when Jesus is talking is he actually directs our attention forward. So first it's back remembering what he did and he also directs us forward, encouraging us that Jesus is coming back. Jesus, he will return. The verse says this, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Guys, this, this gets me fired up. I, I, don't want, I don't want us to get it twisted. Our Lord is coming back. God will return. He will send Jesus. He will come in the clouds. Every, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Guys, Jesus, he was born a baby. He, he preached as a child. He was killed as a man. He arose on the third day, but he's coming back as a king. He will come back and he will draw all things to the ways that it should be. I love this quote by Billy Graham. It says this, the second coming of Christ will be so revolutionary that it will change every aspect of life on this planet. Christ will reign in righteousness disease will be arrested, death will be modified, war will be abolished, nature will be changed, man will live as it was originally intended he should live. That's why God says, set your minds on things above. Set it on the things above because right now is not going to last. That's why it says that our citizenship isn't with a card that says we, we belong to this nation or this people group. Our citizenship is in heaven w- with our savior. That's what we got to look to. So when we, when we take communion, we can look ahead and say, you know what? What I have here, this isn't the end. 
and, and I can't take any of it with me. You know, we talk about that, that we have a God-shaped vacuum inside of all our human hearts. I believe that we actually have more of a heaven-shaped vacuum because we were made for more than this life. We were made to live forever. That was the original intent of God. We were made for being up above. So in communion, when we look forward, we can say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for giving everything and not just saying, this is it. Now you're, you're saved from your sins. We have eternal life. And in a world where we, yes, right now have many trials and many troubles and, and many struggles that are, that are abundantly in front of us, he's saying, this isn't it. This isn't the end of the road. Actually, what we think is the end of the road is actually the beginning because he's at a place right now. He prepares a room for us. And in that place, there'll be many, many things that, that he's going to set as it always was supposed to be. And, and that just gets me fired up because in his word, as we read it, I mean, you can just flip, flip to page after page that he's going to make everything better. As Dave said last week, he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. He's going to abolish the things that we hate. I hate cancer. I hate people losing their jobs. I hate depression. I loathe suicide. I despise anxiety. And God does too. And he wants to say bye to it. And that's something that we get to do every time we take communion, that one day he's gonna come back. And when he comes back, this is what comes with him. All the ramifications of heaven follows behind him in the clouds. And we can look to that and we can celebrate and we can say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you have done that for me. But we can't forget the final part of communion, that he directs our attention to the now what we call self-examination. In the word, it says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. You know, in, in addition, it provides a time for believers to, to put their, their week, their month, their life to the test, examine themselves. This is not a new concept. I mean, I think about Psalm and, and Psalm as verse after verse littered about David examining his heart. I think about Psalm 26, examine me, O Lord, prove me, try my reins and my heart. Just look at me, am I, am I following you? Am, am I doing what you have intended for me? Lamentation, same thing. Search us, try our ways, turn again, make us turn again to you. And, and when we see this, um, there's a reason why Paul was saying that. Paul was saying this to the, to the people of Corinth in 1 Corinthians because they were not having the right heart. We see that they were actually getting drunk. We see that they were being gluttonous. We see that they were stealing from the poor. Essentially, people would come who didn't have the ability to bring food and they would say, hey, you didn't bring anything, you don't get any food. So now there was a separation of the rich and the poor. You see, at this time, communion was less of a little cracker and, and a little cup of juice. It was more of a, of a meal, more of an event. And it became more of a party than remembering Jesus. And so Paul, he, he called them out and he said, no, 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 that, that's not what communion is supposed to be. We're supposed to remember him. We're supposed to be thankful for him. We're supposed to look at the truth that he is coming back. We're supposed to examine our hearts and see if we're in a good place. And, and so essentially this is a heart check. When we come into communion each week, it's a time that we pause and we run the reel from back, back weeks or days or whatever. We, we run that, that reel of film and, and we see, is my heart in the right spot? 
We see in his word, are, are we at a place that, that we are recognizing what Jesus has done? Are we remembering what he's done? We, we think about something with me and that has been on my heart. Is there anyone right now in my life that I am not at peace with, that I haven't tried to be at peace with? Scripture says, if we have anything against our brother and sister in Christ, we got to stop what we're doing. We got to go and make peace with them. So is there someone right now that we need to make peace with? Another thing we have to think about with communion, this is huge. This is something at Eastside that, that is, that's massive is you can take communion if you have surrendered your life to Jesus. So, so we see in the word that this is something that happens with the believers. Once they give their life, they die to their old self. They're raised up through baptism and in, in newness of life. They're clothed with Christ. That is something that, that they can partake in. Also, we see that this is something that um, is a moment of confession. You know, if there's a time when you come into communion and you realize that you have, you've screwed up, you've, you have dropped the ball, you have, you've come up short, this is a time of confession that you can just say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for talking about my brother like that. Forgive me for falling into that sin, that temptation of lust, that temptation of hatred, that temptation of pornography, that temptation of bitterness, whatever it is, we bring it to God and we say, God, I lay this at your feet. I have sinned and I need my savior. I need what you gave me on that cross. So those are some things that we need to do when, when we come into his presence in this time of communion. But in all this, and I think about each one of these things, looking back, looking forward, right? Looking ahead to what he's gonna bring in our life, examining our life now. This all has to be covered with a spirit of gratitude. Thank you. I love this quote. It says, a thankful heart is one of the primary identifying characteristics of a believer. It stands in stark contrast to pride, selfishness, and worry. And it helps fortify the believer's trust in the Lord and reliance of his provision. Even in the toughest times, no matter how choppy the seas become, a believer's heart is buoyed by constant praise and gratefulness to our Lord. It's lifted up by constant gratitude. And, and we see that in, in the word, be joyful always. It doesn't mean to be ignorant of the pain happening in your life. It doesn't mean that you don't you know, say, yes, I have this huge issue. It doesn't mean we're, we're being disillusioned. What it means is we look at our difficulty and we remember that God is greater that God is better than that trouble, than that, than that trial. And he's gonna deliver us through it in, in this life or the next. In, in this life, we might see true victory, but God might not give us the victory that we expect. But nonetheless, we know he has the best intentions for our life. What we see is in Matthew 26, verse 30, at the end of the Lord's Supper, um, there's a very intimate moment with the disciples. And when I was reading through the gospels and reading the different accounts, I noticed something that I totally forgot. And to be honest, it, it pierced me right in the heart because they sang a song, they sang a hymn. And I was thinking about this season of our church and how we get to worship through a camera, but um, we don't get to do it in person like we did. And that, that's something that's so intimate to be in a room of people worshiping our God and what he did. So Jesus, he chose to feed them a meal in this last moment with them. And at the end of that conversation, he chose for them to sing. And so when I was, I was reading that and researching, I was like, man, that's amazing. Actually, that's what a lot of people did during the Passover meal. They would sing what was called the Hillel. And the Hillel was a group of five Psalms, Psalm 113 verse through Psalm 118. And they would sing these at the beginning and then follow through to the end. And so they would end with Psalm 118. So in that moment, the disciples, they went to sing what is believed to be Psalm 118. And so I want us to do something right now. 
I want everyone to close their eyes. No matter if you're in your living room, you're listening to this in your car, please keep your eyes open if you're driving. And uh, maybe you're in your bedroom, wherever you are, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine something with me for a second. Imagine this upper room. Jesus is with his best friends. He's hanging out with them. They've just shared a meal. I can imagine what's going on in his mind and his heart. Soon after this, he's gonna go into the garden of Gethsemane and cry out to God, if this can pass me, if you can take this cup from me, will you do it? And God says, no, no, I'm not. And, and he's in this moment, the disciples have just heard that Jesus is going to die. And he says, this is my new covenant to remember my body that's gonna be broken Remember my blood that's gonna be shed. His betrayer has already left. And disciples are still confused. Well, what does he mean by that? And in that moment, the last thing he chooses to do is sing this psalm. So I want you to put yourself in the mind of some of these disciples, the mind of Jesus, and listen to these lyrics of this song that we know as Psalm 118. This is what it says. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants, the priests, repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord repeat, his faithful love endures forever. From my distress, I called upon the Lord and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. For what can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. So don't forget, to look forward to what God is going to do, to examine yourself, looking at your heart, seeing if you are in a place to take that with purity. And of course, remembering what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Let us pray. Father, I wanna just thank you for this moment, that in that, in that final meal with your disciples, you could have done anything. You could have sent them out to do one last task. You could have went on a journey with them. But what you decided to do was to share a meal. You decided that the intimacy of a meal was what you wanted to do. And you gave us communion, something that we get to celebrate every single week. Thank you for communion. Thank you that we can remember how you passed over our sins that you chose to pass over the pride, the anger, the bitterness, the lust, the dissension, the envy, the lying, the cheating, whatever it is, we fill in that blank. You chose to pass over it. And the reality is we didn't, we didn't deserve that. We still don't deserve that. But you said we're worthy. You said that we are worth every single drop of blood that was shed on that cross. And you were thinking about us there. When you were there on that cross, you were thinking about the men and women, the saints, the Christians that would stand firm in your faith, even in this moment. In the trials that we're facing every single day, you knew that we would stand on the promises of that cross. We love you, God. We are we are so thankful. We give all gratitude to you to where it should be. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this all in your name. Amen.
So thanks for joining us today. Uh, great message from Winston, and now we've got a, a new view of what Thursday was like for Jesus. And so next week, we'll come back, and uh, I'm going to teach about Friday, and we all know what happened on Friday, so make sure that you're, you're ready for that next Sunday and be able to join us with that. Uh, but it's good to have you. Don't forget to do your giving as soon as we're done, and uh, be faithful to that, and uh, stay connected with people, and be smart. Let's be smart and get over this thing. God bless you. We'll see you soon.